beginning at verse 1. Verse 1. This is particularly applicable for us today. You'll see why in a moment. And to the angel of the church at Sardis write, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, representing the seven churches to whom he is addressing his letters, says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which are about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, and keep it and repent. Now, how many times so far in the letters to the seven churches have we heard the word, seen the word, repent? If, therefore, you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come upon you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. Okay, a couple things about the city. They're important, uh, given, and you have, given the con it's the context in which this letter is written. Sardis, by the way, was a has-been city. Okay, that's, that's the best thing I can say about it. It was a has-been city. Once upon a time, it was commercially prosperous. Once upon a time, it was politically important as well as militarily strategic, but no longer. It was notable, though, for its Acropolis, which was primarily the temple of Artemis. Now, let me tell you why it's important. The Acropolis rose 800 feet above, above the, uh, in the north section of the city, and it was virtually impregnable uh, from, because of its rock walls, which rose almost vertical. Only twice in its... Now, the city could be entered and could be captured by coming from the south, but if the inhabitants made it to the Acropolis, again, it was virtually only twice in its history was it ever captured, even though there were many, many tax, attacks against it. Sardis also had an impressive necropolis. If you don't know what that is, it's simply a cemetery. Okay? In fact, it was known as the city of a thousand hills because even as far away as seven miles, you could see hundreds of of burial mounds that were visible on the skyline of the city. Now, i got to tell you, that's not an impressive sight for a city. <laughs> uh, a skyline, I'd like to see a lot more things, but that's one of the things the city was known for. However, even though it was a has-been city, there was something about Sardis that was not in the past. It somehow retained its tremendous wealth. It was an extremely wealthy city. But even though its political brilliance as a former capital, which it was no longer, lay in the past, it was still a very wealthy city and had many, many wealthy people. However, we also know by reading some of the other uh, parallel histories of this city at this time, that wealth led, as it often does with people of wealth, to tremendous moral decadence. It was a city of decay morally. It was a city where virtually anything went and everything goes. And, that's a, and that is the context that you find this church and the risen Christ speaking to this city. city Sardis was known as a city of peace. However, it's not the kind of peace you want. It was not the kind of peace that comes because you gained a victory in battle. It's the kind of peace that comes along when a person's dreams are dead and a person is asleep. That kind of peace. It was a city that was dead, and we're going to discover in a moment it was a church in that city that was also dead. 
one reflected the other. One thing about Sardis, and, and this is very important for some of the imagery that we're going to see here, it did have a flourishing wool industry. That was one of its notable features. Now the Lord tells us, notice what he says here. He says, I know your deeds. I know your condition. I know your spiritual condition. I know your true condition. He knows their deeds, and perhaps this particular church at one time had the reputation of being a with it church, a very alive church. But the risen Lord says, not only are their deeds incomplete, but their deeds that they were practicing at that time had rendered the church itself dead. This is a dead church. They may claim to be a healthy church and probably did, but it was not so. So let's ask this question. How does a church die? How does a church die? I'm going to get into this a little bit more as we go through these verses, but let me just, just say this for a moment. Churches die because of compromise, particularly morally and doctrinally in terms of belief. Churches die because they become complacent. They like it just the way it is. And they don't want anyone, including God at times, to change anything. And churches die because they become, as individuals, apathetic. Apathetic about the church, apathetic about their own spiritual growth, apathetic about their mission, apathetic just in general. Now let me share something else with you. Unfortunately in our culture, what tools of measuring do we use to define a church that is alive. I pastored three churches uh, that were big churches. I mean, they weren't mega churches, but they were big churches. Two of them had somewhere close to 2,000 or more than 2,000 members. And I found in churches of that size that the definition of being a live church was twofold. First was numerical. Your numbers are good. you got to be alive. The second was activity. Get busy. As long as we're a really busy church, then we must be alive. But I want you to know something. The risen Lord here says, I know your deeds. It wasn't as if they were, weren't doing anything or there wasn't any activity. But whatever activity in which they were involved, whatever deeds that, they were being, that was being practiced, didn't contribute to them being alive. So what makes a church alive besides the Holy Spirit? What makes a church alive? And, I'm, and this is it. It's faithfulness. That's what makes a church alive. It's interesting to me that none of the seven churches survived much past the first century, the end of the first none of them and that's interesting and you would think that a church that churches uh, in the first century that were alive numerically and growing and everything else that they would have a long long history that's not really true churches come and go but the believers themselves must be faithful whether they're part of a of this church or that church or whatever church we must remain faithful to God faithful in our hearts faithful in terms of uh, what we give in turn give of ourselves to the Lord faithful to our church wherever we might be it is faithfulness that is the mark of being alive in the New Testament there were churches that were few in number in terms of how many people they had but they were more alive than a lot of other churches who might have had more numbers. There were churches that may have had not much activity going on because there was so much persecution and they were limited in the activity, but they were more alive than those churches that fell into the culture. We always must remember that. Okay, like the city itself, which at one time had been a great royal city, but was now nothing, the citizens in that city were living off its past.
past things. And that same spirit had affected this church. Uh, their loyalty and service to Christ was pretty much in the past. These are the kind of people that talk about what they used to be, what they used to do for God. You know? I mean, I've heard a lot of that among Christians. You know, what's more important is, what, what, what are you doing for God right now? Or more importantly, what is God doing in your life right now? That is what we should be talking about, not what we used to be, but what is going on right now. And it may be, and, the, and there are a lot of commentators who believe this, I believe this, it may be that they had so made peace with their culture in which they lived, that the offense of the cross had ceased to be a real issue for this church. And so the citizens put up with the church because they no longer offended their culture. They were no longer in jeopardy of losing their lives because of their stance for Christ. They were no longer vulnerable to suffering because of their, because of their faith. Because they pretty much, apparently reading between the lines here, and a couple other things we know about this church, they pretty much caved in to their culture. Unfortunately, this sounds like a description of far too many churches in our culture today. Giving in to the culture. We'll get to that in a moment, too. More on that in a moment. Okay. In fact, things were so peaceful in this church, so peaceful, they didn't know they were dead. They didn't know they were dead. And I think sometimes churches get to a place where, hey, we like this. We don't, we don't like having this stuff to have to deal with. So we get it to where we peace. And then you're dead and you don't know it. And the risen Lord had to come along and say, you are dead. They didn't know. I, I pastored a church one time that actually had people that came to me and said, you know, after I've been there a few years, said, you know, we really didn't know we were dead. And they didn't. And that's a sad commentary. Thus, notice what the Lord says next. He, he says, wake up. This is a word that can, means to be constantly watchful. Don't lose your edge. This is a church that lost its edge spiritually. They were no longer awake. They had given in to the culture, and probably most of the people didn't even know it, but I think most of them did. It is a call to reverse their attitudes radically. They must see the seriousness of their situation, which is dire, but according to the Lord, it is not totally hopeless. Immediate steps, though, must be taken as the risen Christ says in his words in our text, to strengthen what remains. There isn't a lot that remains. But what remains could be the foundation to rebuild this church. The believers in this church are in danger of judgment now because Christ has not found their deeds complete. Now note that word complete. The word complete, that is, is used here, means Fulfilled. It means filled up to the measure in the sight of God. This church did not measure up to the standard that Christ sets. They may have measured up to their own standard. They may have even measured up to the standard their culture had for churches, but they were not measuring up to the standard that Christ had for his churches. These folks must remember, he says in verse 3, they must remember what they have received and heard. And that means what they had received was the teaching of the apostles that gave them the gospel in the first place. And what they had heard is the combined teachings of both the apostles and the prophets who had brought the gospel to them in its full form. They must remember and they must ha wake up again to these things that they received and heard and unlike the church, the next church we're going to get to is the church at Philadelphia. These folks did not hold to the Word of God. They did not hold to the Word of God. And so repentance was the only way out, and God calls them to repentance here. 
the only way out of a certain and final death for them, not just for them as a church, but for them as individuals as well. They were to repent by restoring the very gospel they had received and by restoring the doctrine that the apostles had given to them, they were to repent to get to a position where that gospel and where the authority of God's word once again had authority in their lives and they were once again obeying the truth of God's word. And by the way, this is the problem in America today. So many churches may be may have a lot of people, they may have a lot of activities, but the only thing that God looks at a church as far as his his own evaluation is, do we measure up? Do we measure up to the standard of Christ and do we continue to hold God's word and the teachings in this word, do we continue to hold the authority of them? Because, as you and I both know, there are many churches, many Christian denominations who have pretty much jettisoned a great deal of the, what I would call, absolute certainty of many of the teachings of God's Word. I mean, they've just kind of shoved in the past. In fact, sometimes I wonder with some of these churches and with some of these denominations, how they can even call themselves Christian. I mean, what's Christian about them? They have, they have rejected so much that is so important. They've rejected uh, so much teaching that is critical, that is absolutely biblical. You have to wonder what they do believe. I really do wonder sometimes why churches have done this. I mean, I've shared with some of this with you before, but there is one mainline denomination in America today that oh, at the end of World War II, back in the early 50s, let's say, uh, Southern Baptists had about 5,000 uh, missionaries, uh, international missionaries across the world. Baptists had international missionaries. There's another mainline denomination, I don't want to mention their name because it's not that important, really, that had about the same number. Okay? Uh, the number of missionaries that Southern Baptists have put out has grown, not near where any of us, any, anybody would like for it to be. But, you know, this other mainline denomination, about 5,000, somewhere between four and 5,000 uh, missionaries scattered across the world sharing the gospel, telling people about Jesus. And we think they are today. Same denomination. And by the way, there are many, this denomination has grown in terms of the number of churches that have come into the denom denomination because there were other churches that made it a more unified denomination. So how many do you think they would be? The last count I saw, which was three years ago, was they had 265. They went from almost 5,000 missionaries in, you know, scattered across the world sharing the gospel of Christ, 265. Now, how does that happen? And it happens when you jettison the solid, critical teachings in God's Word. And once you do that, then you begin to wonder, well, why are we even sharing the gospel? If the gospel is not all that essential, why are we even sharing it? If people really don't go to hell, and many in this denomination no longer believe that people really do go to hell, if people really do don't go to hell, why are we out here? Why are we spending our money sending people out there to tell people about Jesus? Let's just go out and help them and that kind of thing, you know. And it's what I call sort of a religious peace corps. And that's what, unfortunately, a lot of uh, missionary enterprises for some denominations have become. And my whole point is this. When we get away from what the Bible teaches, and some people become too legalistic in that. But when we get away from what the Bible teaches, it starts affecting us as individuals. It starts affecting our families. It starts affecting our churches. And it's certainly counterproductive to our witness. And it's a really, really pro problem in America today with so many Christian denominations. Unless the church repents, the Lord says, notice what it says, 
He will come to them in judgment like a thief. Now, first thing, this is not a reference to his second coming, even though Jesus said, I'm coming like a thief in the night. I come when you least expect it, like a thief. You don't expect a thief to come to your house. Here, the risen Lord is talking about uh, he's coming in judgment against this church like a thief, and it's underscoring the suddenness, how quickly it's going to happen if they don't repent, which means at least from the risen Lord's standpoint, there's a time period involved. And it's sooner than they think before they lose their whole place in the church. Now, while the majority in that church, and it is majority, because the Lord uses the word few a little bit later, while majority in that church had departed from obedience in the church, according to verse 4, a few in the church had remained true, but they were in a decided minority. They had not, now see these words, they had not soiled their clothes. Now this goes to this whole uh, idea of the wool industry in Sardis. This is a big deal. Because in Sardis, those with soiled garments were removed from the public list of citizens. In other words, you couldn't go around town dirty with dirty clothes. That's literally what it meant. And I guess they were so wealthy and they had such availability of having wool, you know, to wear that it was considered improper and they were removed from the list of citizens. More importantly, in the pagan religions in that city, which even pagan religion was dying, I mean, it was just not a very religious city at all, but in those pagan religions, it was literally forbidden to approach the gods there in that city in garments that were soiled or stained. You might, ha you might only have enough money to wear rags, but they better be cleaned or you cannot come to the pagan worship. So what the Lord has, said, has to say about here about soiled their garments speaks to a lot of things. The soiling here is a symbol here of so many Christians in this church who had mingled with the pagan lifestyle. They had capitulated, maybe not totally, but they had capitulated to the pagan lifestyle. That's how they had soiled their garments. They may have continued to go on to church, but like so many Christians in America today, outside of that 11 o'clock hour on Sunday morning, they didn't have white clothing. They capitulated to the culture. And there was no longer a purity in the relationship with Jesus. But he says, on the other hand, to walk with Christ symbolized celebration and fellowship with him. White garments, by the way, this is not the first time, this is not the only time we're going to see this in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, white garments are always not just Revelation, but throughout the New Testament, are always symbolic of the righteousness, the victory, and the glory of God. That's why soil their garments is a big deal. He's telling the people in this church, the majority, you folks have really gotten dirty morally and spiritually. And if you don't wake up, I'm coming in judgment. And then finally, we have the overcomer's promise, as we do in every letter to the churches. And it's threefold, then I'm through. Uh, it grows out, this promise, by the way, grows out of this reference to white clothing in verse 5. First, like the faithful Christians who will receive white clothes from Christ, at the end of time we will all be dressed in, in white, the time of the last judgment, the others who have overcome the stains of the pagan society will similarly be dressed in white. The few who did remain faithful will be dressed in white. Their clothes are not soiled. And so they don't have on them the stains of living or being part of a pagan lifestyle. Secondly, their pure relationship to Christ is part of the 
permanent guarantee of their citizenship. He says, I will never erase him who is not soiled his garment from the book of life. Now, we all know, because the Old Testament talks about the book of life, that this is a very common metaphor in the Bible. But it has a particular uh, important reference here, and here's the reference here in this particular city. Ancient cities, Sardis being one of them at that time, had names of citizens that were recorded in a register until their death, and then their names were removed from the book of the living. And so Christ's statement here is the strongest affirmation we have that death can never separate us, as Paul tells us, from the love of God. Death is not a separator, okay? Even though you may be stricken from the book of the living, if you die as a citizen of Sardis, I will never erase your name from the book of life if you stay pure in your relationship with me. In some cases, by the way, those Christians who were loyal to Christ in this city and, and were under the constant threat of being branded political and social rebels, even by some of their fellow Christians, by the way, and if they were regarded as that and if it could be proven, then they were stripped of their citizenship. But Christ promises them eternal citizenship. They may kick you out of being a citizen of Sardis. You may lose that citizenship, but you won't lose your citizenship. It's everlasting, but only if we remain loyal to him. Thirdly, Christ promises to, notice this, acknowledge his name, he who has not, or her who has not, sold their garments before the Father and his angels. The word acknowledge is a very strong word. It's a word of confession before the court. It's the strongest confession you can make before the court, and it's always a positive confession to the court. It's almost like a, a jury coming back and declaring not guilty in loud words. It is the Lord's confession of our name before the Father and his angels. This one belongs to me. He or she has not soiled their garments and assures us of our heavenly citizenship. Therefore, what ultimately counts, this is what many Christians forget, is not our acceptance by the society in which we live, not our acceptance in the culture in which we live, but our relationship with Christ. And so many Christians, and I'm talking about church-going Christians who go regularly to church have just, they no longer think that's important. The biggest problem we have in America today is the need for approval. I want you to think about it. Everybody, those kids across the hall, they're, you know, the, the one main goal is to fit in. It starts early in our lives and, and the culture wants to squeeze us into this mold where we fit in. And we don't feel rejected. And we fit in. And we have the approval of uh, other people we're around, our co-workers and everybody else. And we increasingly are living in a culture where Christians no longer have the approval of the culture in which we live. We all know what we're talking about. I mean, increasingly it seems that our culture has become more and more hostile. And this is true just in the last 10 years. More and more hostile to Bible-believing Christians. To those who want to continue to follow the teachings of the Bible and to want to continue to be Christian in the way that God measures Christianity, and it seems more and more we are, we're going to have to choose. Either we're going to be approved, or we're going to be ostracized. In 10 years from now, it's going to be far worse than anything we're looking at right now. 
And I have to tell you, it's scary. If somebody would have told me we've been here as a country and Christians would be under this much pressure to conform, I would have laughed them in the face. But it has happened. It's not that it's going to happen. It has already happened. It's going to get worse. Which tells me, at least from an American standpoint, that the time of the Lord's appearing is very, very near. It has to be. It has to be. I don't know how much longer the world can continue to go when, especially in the Western world, where most of the Western world has rejected what made the West so strong, their Christian foundation. Revival is occurring in Africa. It's occurring in places in Asia. And as long as revival is occurring and people in droves are coming to Christ, the Lord will tarry His coming. And so I keep looking to that thinking the Lord's tearing, the Lord is tearing, so people are still coming to Christ. But I think that's probably going to slow down. And more and more people will be squeezed into the culture's mold. Either you line up and conform to what we say you should be, believe, how you should think, the more ostracized Christians will become. Even though the world will ostracize us, the one thing they cannot take away from us is our heavenly inheritance. That's what the risen Christ is telling us. Don't be afraid to live out and to live it out loud. You're a Christian witness because you can't lose the most important thing. You see, it's you. That's what has to enter back. God, we're very much aware, almost on a daily basis, how more and more in the culture that we live, we as Bible-believing Christians seem to be squeezed out of the fabric of the cultural life. And if we don't conform, then we're going to be increasingly ostracized. And God, it's very tempting for us because none of us here, none of us want to be ostracized. We all want to fit in. We all want to feel the approval of those around us. We all want to be feel the approval of our culture. So it's just not going to happen. Not if we stay pure in our relationship with others. It's not And as Agnes prayed for earlier, God, I pray for our children and teenagers. They're going to be living in a world that is so hostile to Bible-believing Christianity. I fear for them. But I pray that that generation will be the hope for the revival that needs to come this country, that you will wake up that generation and help them to see how far we have come away from who we are, and you will begin doing a work in that generation and revive this nation, revive this culture, that once again, Christians are not ostracized. We're not looked upon as bad people, but rather these are the kind of people in you. We don't fear that because we can't lose our citizenship. May we live one. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay.